Yeah, uh, living, it's a risky business. Uh, every single day we are bombarded with newspaper headlines telling us what we should and shouldn't be doing. And we're expected to use these headlines to inform our day-to-day -day lives. As a statistician, I believe that data has the power to illuminate, to inform, to provide insight into the everyday world. But in this era of fake news and lies, down lies, and statistics, what are we supposed to do with these sensationalized headlines? In this talk, I'm going to give you the tools that you need to ask the right questions of the headlines that you see so that you can make decisions that are informed on evidence. And I'm going to start out by talking about the humble bacon sandwich. Now, if the newspaper headlines are anything to be believed, bacon is one of the worst things that you could be eating. Your risk of uh, pancreatic cancer increases by 20% if you eat bacon on a daily basis. Now, a shocking statistic that actually caused bacon sales to plummet. But is it really anything that you actually need to be worried about? Crucially, when we see these headlines, they're what we call relative risks. And we call them relative risks because they're just telling us what the risk is in one group relative to another. I know that if I eat bacon, my chance of pancreatic cancer is 20% higher than if I didn't eat bacon. But it doesn't tell me anything about what my risk is. To do that, I need to know what the absolute risks are, and they depend on the actual numbers. So how do I take those relative risks that I see in the newspaper headlines and turn them into absolute risks, which are useful? To first, so first of all, I need to know, what are my chances of getting pancreatic cancer? According to Cancer Research UK, we have a one in 80 lifetime risk of pancreatic cancer. What does that mean? If we were to take 400 individuals who didn't eat bacon, we would expect five of them to get pancreatic cancer anyway. So then let's look back at our headline. It says that our daily fry-up boosts our cancer risk by 20%. Okay, well that's a fifth. What's a fifth of five? It's just one. Meaning that my risk of pancreatic cancer goes from five in every 400 individuals to six in every 400 individuals. It's only an extra one person in every 400. So whilst that 20% increase sounds really shocking, sounds really scary, just an extra one person in every 400, all of a sudden, doesn't sound anywhere near as bad. There were headlines that said, bacon, ham, and sausages were now as big a threat as smoking, the World Health Organization to warn. Now, the reason behind this headline is that the WHO produced these lists every year of known risk factors for different types of cancer. And smoking was already on there as a known risk factor for lung cancer, and processed meat was going on this list for the first time. So they were saying that they now were as risky as each other. But how do the risks for lung cancer and smoking compare to those that we've just seen for pancreatic cancer and bacon? If you take 400 individuals who don't smoke, you would expect four of them to get lung cancer anyway. If you smoke 25 or more cigarettes every day, that actually goes up 24 times to 96 in every 400. So it's an extra 92 in every 400 compared to that extra one in every 400 for pancreatic cancer. Now these lists, they're based on what we call statistical significance. And statistical significance just tells us whether or not something definitely does or definitely doesn't cause cancer. So yes, bacon may be statistically significant in causing pancreatic cancer, but to say that it is as big a threat, to say it is as risky as smoking, you can see is absolute nonsense because the risks are completely different. Also, what we need to think about is that this compared the two extremes. It compared those who ate bacon every single day with those who never ate it. And the risk was only an extra one in every 400. If you eat bacon once a week as a treat to yourself, say a Saturday morning, that's going to have an even smaller effect on your risk of pancreatic cancer. But newspaper headlines love to take the two extremes and use them as a justification for never doing an activity. Also, if you're eating bacon for breakfast every day, you're not eating fruit for breakfast every day. You may be more likely to have an unhealthy lifestyle in general. 
So how do we know that it's the bacon that's actually caused this increased risk of cancer? And it's not one of these other unhealthy lifestyle factors instead. And what we say in statistics is that correlation doesn't always mean causation. The best way to explain that is to think about ice cream sales. As ice cream sales go up, so do the number of drownings. So does that mean that ice cream causes drownings? No. Both of these things are affected by a third factor, what we call a confounding factor, and that's the temperature. As the temperatures increase, so too do the number of ice cream sales, and also so too do the number of people who go in the water, meaning that naturally there are more drownings. And we can allow for this confounding factor in our statistical analysis, and once we do that, that direct relationship between ice cream sales and drownings actually disappears. Spurious correlations are absolutely everywhere. Did you know that there is a 95% correlation between the per capita consumption of cheese and the number of people who died by becoming tangled in their bedsheets? <laughs> so does, does this mean we shouldn't eat cheese before we go to bed because we might die? Of course not. These are two things that just happen to be correlated with each other. And it doesn't mean that one is necessarily causing the other. There's some great examples of correlation versus causation in the news. Uh, there's some lovely headlines that say fizzy drinks make teenagers violent. Uh, children drinking fizzy drinks are regularly more likely to carry a gun. <laughs> now, it could be, it could be that drinking fizzy drinks makes teenagers violent, um, or it could be that there is a third confounding, say, social demographic factor that means teenagers are more likely to be violent and also means that they are more likely to drink fizzy drinks. Or it could be that being violent is thirsty work and at the end of it you want a fizzy drink. <laughs> we don't know which way round this relationship goes. I was asked to comment on a story in the BBC uh, that looked at dementia and it said living near a busy road increased your risk of dementia. Now, when I went and looked at the study in more detail, crucially, this study didn't allow for family history in their analysis. We know that there's a big family history element when it comes to dementia, but I also argued that there's probably a family history element in where you live. If you grow up in the middle of a big city, you might be more likely to live in a big city yourself as you get older. If you grow up in the middle of the countryside, you might be more likely to live in the countryside yourself as an adult. So you've got this family history element to do with where you might live and this family history element on your risk of dementia. And so to ignore that in your analysis, I said, was a major downfall of the study. Now, there's another thing that I always ask myself when I see stats in the news, and that's what about the uncertainty? Now, in public discussion of scientific research, Uncertainty is often seen as a deficiency. You know, it means that our results are unreliable. They're not worth the paper that they're written on. Scientific research is rarely 100% certain. In statistics, you know, we take samples, and we, we, the estimates that we get out from those samples, we use those to make inferences on a population level. But if I took different samples, I would get slightly different estimates. And uncertainty captures this perfectly. Doesn't mean that my results are untrustworthy. Doesn't mean that I can't make decisions based on them. But it is really important that the uncertainty is communicated because the amount of uncertainty may affect just what decisions we actually make. To show you why uncertainty is so important, I want to consider a headline from back in 2016 that said unemployment had dropped by 28,000. Great, amazing, unemployment's dropped by 28,000. That's an amazing headline. Buried way, way, way in the depths of this article, though, were these following sentences, where we said that the figures are based on a large survey, so they're estimates, they're not precise figures. The margin of error was 79,000, <laughs> meaning, that the precise figure could have been anywhere from an increase in 51,000 to a decrease in 107,000. <laughs> Hang on a minute. So the headline says unemployment drops by 28,000. 
But actually, it could have dropped by over 100,000, or it could have increased by 51,000. I mean, that headline really just doesn't tell us anything about what's going on. And the amount of uncertainty here just shows how important it is to communicate that. Because you may have made very different decisions based on whether or not it was a 51,000 increase or a 107,000 decrease. We don't do very well at communicating uncertainty. I looked at the, news, uh, the uh, weather forecast for Newcastle. Uh, so what are we now? We're about half 11, so there's, what, about 11% chance of rain at the minute. Uh, 3 o'clock, it goes up to a 21% chance of rain. 4 o'clock, it's a 23% chance of rain. These are all very precise point estimates on an hour-by-hour -hour basis. Without knowing what the uncertainty is, how am I supposed to use this to decide whether or not I should be taking my umbrella out with me? Uncertainty, it doesn't need to be very difficult to communicate. Graphics, they're a great way of communicating very complex statistical information in a very efficient way. You know, wide confidence bars would show that we've got a lot of uncertainty and maybe our results aren't as reliable as if we had short confidence bars that show that we're very certain about the results that we get. Said graphics, they have the ability to do great good. They also have the ability to do great evil. Um, I want to share with you now uh, some of my favorite bad graphics, just to make you aware of some of the pitfalls that you should be looking out for. Uh, the first one comes from Fox News. This is the 2012 presidential run. Now, for those of you not familiar with pie charts, uh, these percentages, <laughs> these percentages should sum up to 100%. You usually use pie charts when it's an either or. So which of these candidates do you support? And, and that would have been fine in a pie chart. What I suspect they've asked here is, would you back this candidate, yes or no? And they felt a pie chart um, was the best way to communicate that information. Uh, it isn't. It's not the best way to communicate that information. Um, the Office of National Statistics deserve a slap on the wrist for this graphic. Uh, so this is looking at uh, GDP uh, estimates. So it's the uh, increases in GDP estimates. And they had two estimates of this. A first one that was uh, a growth of 0.6%, and then a second estimate, which was a growth of 0.7%. So the difference between these two estimates is 0.1 percentage point. However, by zooming in sufficiently far on this plot, it makes it look like the difference in estimates is, is huge. So there's a lesson that when you see plots, they could tell very different stories, whether or not they're zoomed in or zoomed out. So always make sure that you're looking at the axes and see just how zoomed in uh, your plots are. And my last favorite bad graphic is by Ben and Jerry's, and it's really awful. Uh, ben and Jerry seem to think that 62% is smaller than 61%, and that 24% is quite a lot smaller than 21%. Um, here is an example of Ben and Jerry's wanting to tell a particular story. Unfortunately, when they got the data, they didn't tell the story that they wanted. So they've just drawn it and hoped that we won't take too much interest in what the numbers actually say. Um, I mean, this is just awful. Um, and it's a really nice example of really bad graphics and why you should always really pay attention to the details. Have a look at the numbers, not just what the bars are telling you. So just like to uh, finish by saying it's not all doom and gloom. Um, I don't know if any of you read the BBC uh, earlier on this week. There was a story on the BBC on Monday that said that red meat was back on the menu. Um, and it looked at those bacon stats in more detail. A new study had come out, and they'd looked at them in more detail. And this was a really great article, putting statistics in context. So it, it looked at the absolute risks as well as the relative risks. It looked at different risk factors, and you know, bacon may increase your risk by this, but all these other things increase it more. It was a really great example of how I'd like to see journalism going when it comes to presenting statistics in the media. But until we reach that point, I would just say to you, when you see statistics in the media, if it's a relative risk, think, what's the absolute risk behind that? If you see something that's causal, have a think to yourself, could this be a correlation? Always ask what the uncertainty is on any 
point estimates. Most importantly, eat bacon, <laughs> but don't eat cheese before you go to bed. <laughs> I have been Jennifer Rogers. Thank you very much. <laughs>